I want to take this opportunity now to kind of dive into your story. But before we even get there, you know, obviously we're going to talk about your near-death experience and what that was like for you and how you it was such a transformative experience for you. But who were you before your near-death experience? Um, that's a good question. I was a very different person back then. Um, I had worked for a few years in TV and film. I was also a home builder. And so I had a lot of extensive background of, of working physically moving my body. And I was very much focused on building my body at the time. I had been a heavy partier. I had started to clean up my life and get sober. And I was about nine months into getting sober when my actual event happened. Um, but yeah, I was, I was very much a 25 year old single kid uh, living definitely on the more wild side. And I had started to tame that wild side down for about nine months um, as I was trying to build my body and, and trying to turn over a new leaf for myself. And that's when this happened. That's when my, my experience happened. So you were on a journey towards a better version of yourself before this experience I happened? Was, I had a, a particular experience where I woke up after one hard weekend. I didn't know anyone that I was with. No one. Mm. And I saw some some big receipts that I would have to pay for with my credit card. And and I didn't know any of the people that were with me spending my money. And, and I was like, this is not the life I want. And and it was interesting because from that experience forward, I realized that I need to be very um, picky about my friends. Because some of my friends, I could go through a weekend like that and be okay and be protected and and you know, uh, but at the same time, I needed to re, uh, reassess who I was calling friends. And yes. that's what I was doing. I was in the process of, of legitimately cleaning up my life uh, when this all happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that amplified that for you. So could you walk us through your near-death experience? Yeah. So it, it started in 2003. Um, in 2003, I was, um, again, very much into bodybuilding and, and working out my body. We had, me and my best friend at the time, we had ordered a supplement, and this supplement was extremely uh, popular. It was hard to find anywhere. So we went online, and online you could find it. You'd have to go to different countries typically to find it, but we found some in Thailand. We ordered it when it came. It's, it's a liquid supplement. It looked like normal and it smelled like the normal supplement. So we each took a little uh, liquid bottle cap, just t drink a little bottle cap of this stuff. It would really help your muscles recover a lot faster than normal. So we took our bottle cap worth within a few minutes. We both could feel that this stuff was not normal. Um, come to find out later, the stuff that we had ordered was 20 times stronger than, some, than, than any batch we had ever tried before. So our single little bottle cap was actually like taking 20 bottle caps of the normal stuff. So oh, we, didn't, wow. we just didn't know it was a concentrate formula. We thought it was a diluted formula, just like the stuff you get in the United States. Yeah. So that's, <clears throat> that's where it begins. We take this supplement. We both feel ill instantly. Uh, we decide that we're going to go down the street to a Dairy Queen and, and get some breakfast. And hopefully that would um, start to turn things around for us. And so we made, it, made our way down to the Dairy Queen. I went directly into the bathroom. He, my buddy went into the and vomiting all over the booth. And that, that's what ended up um, uh, getting the attention of the manager of the restaurant. He came over and saw him vomiting. He called 911 and they took him away. But meanwhile, it was still me there, and I was in the bathroom uh, going through my own condition. I had fallen. I was on my back, and I, too, started to vomit. But the, the problem was where I vomited and I was laying on my back, that vomit went directly into my lungs as I tried to breathe. And so I, I technically suffocated right there and then on the ground. Now, about 45 minutes after they had they had hauled my buddy away in an ambulance um the manager of the restaurant did find me in the bathroom and he 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 could see that i was dead uh they they called in another ambulance to come 
the second ambulance came with a three-man crew. And this three-man crew came with two veterans and one rookie. And uh, they went ahead and tried to resuscitate the body. They weren't able to. They pronounced it dead. They put it in a body bag. They put the body in the back of the ambulance while they, they filled out paperwork. And they set the rookie to sit in back of the ambulance and watch over this body. While he was there uh, watching over this body, he, he was really feeling bad. He, wanted to, he, he felt like he could do more. He wanted to do more. He felt as if his training should have allowed him to do a lot more for this guy. So he started to have these thoughts that he wished he could do more. And um, then the other two medics came in. They, they loaded in the ambulance. They started to pull away. As they pulled away, though, this light started to form um, from inside this rookie medic. And he actually glowed. He literally glowed. A glowing light was coming out of him. And, and out of nowhere, this really loud voice said, this one's not dead. And, uh, he, you know, the rookie heard it. He kind of froze for a second, and then he kept moving. Uh, they kept moving down the road. He didn't do anything about it. I could hear him think, oh, that was just your imagination. And only a few feet later, the, the voice came again, even louder this time. And as it hit him, it was, you know, he had actually started to glow even brighter. And he heard it. The second time he heard it, um, there was no, no denying it. He heard it. So he went ahead and began to take action. He unzipped the body bag. He had to undo some straps on the body just to even unzip the body bag. And he was feeling around for a pulse. He couldn't feel a pulse. Uh, he went down to the inner thigh. And there's a, there's a big artery down there. He was feeling to see if there was any life, any form of life there down near the femoral artery. And as he was feeling for that, he, he made contact with the femur bone. And as he made contact with that bone, there was this spark. And I could feel the spark to me where I was. And I could tell he felt it because he, like, he jumped a little. And... Um, that was enough of a sign for him. That was enough of a sign that he decided, you know what, I'm going to try to resuscitate this guy. So at that point, he started to force um, oxygen into the lungs. He hooked the body up to a defib machine and he shocked it one round, nothing. Um, the second round of shocks, he did get a single heartbeat and then it was back to flatline. And then the third round of shocks, he got a steady heartbeat to show up. And at this point, um, the other two medics were just almost in awe of this rookie that, that he was able to pull this off. And the miracle to me, one of the miracles, there's many miracles to all of this, but one of the miracles is the fact that that heart started only a few feet from a hospital. And they weren't even taking the body to that hospital. They, it just happened to be that they were taking the body to the medical examiner's office and the route that they were driving led them right past the hospital. And so when this heart started, they were only feet from that hospital. They were able to veer right in and have a trauma team there ready to meet them. So, um, yeah, they were able to get that, that body some treatment right away. As they transfer the body from the, the ambulance gurney into the hospital gurney um, or the hospital bed, as they were doing that transfer, the body started to go into seizure. And that's when um, I started to feel something different about me where I was because I was watching all of this happen from above. I didn't think it was me. I had no idea it was me because me was, was up here watching everything down below. So I went ahead and uh, was watching all of this happen. And as they transferred the body over and it was going into seizures, they started to strap the body down. They got the legs strapped down. They got the right arm strapped down. And as they, they went to strap the left arm, I felt them strapping me. I felt them strapping my left arm. And at that point, um, I started to just have this, this sickening feeling come into me that I'm, I must be really dumb because I've been watching my own death now for probably 30 minutes and I had no idea. Like, no idea. Um, and, and so it was, 
it was very scary for me. I started to actually see all the dumb things I ever did in my life. I started to see all the bad things I ever did in my life. And I had this feeling like, you're not, look at you. Look at all the bad that you've done. Are you, you're not even worth existing. I had that thought. And as soon as I had that thought, I was instantly responded with this energy of love. And this love started to just pour over me. And as it did, I started seeing all the good things that I ever did. I mean, even the little good things that I did, even as a really young boy, the good things I did, all the way up till present day. And I got to, I got to realize that I had done a lot of good, way more good than I had, had ever done bad. And that um, I was worth embracing this love that was pouring over me. That's when I realized that this love that was kind of permeating me and, and really healing me, it was coming from behind me. So I turned around to see where or who this love was coming from. And I see this man all dressed in white, and he has a long white beard, and he has just like these eyes, these piercing eyes. They can like look through you. And as this is happening, I just had the thought, oh, you must be God. And he smiled, and without using his mouth at all, he said, no, son, I'm not God. And so I had the follow-up thought, almost like a stammer. I was like, well, if you're not God, then are you Jesus? Like, you know, and, and he, ex he explained that, no, I'm not Jesus. And he, he loved that I thought he was, but he called himself my guide. He said, I'm your guide to help you go wherever you want to go. You can call me, he, he explained that I could call him Drake, that his, his loved ones in his life had called him Drake, and that I could go wherever he wanted to go. So he motioned to my, my physical body, he motioned to it and said, I can help you go back there. And I looked back at that body, and it looked like hell. The body was, uh, again, in a full seizure. There was all this, this uh, foam and other it was weird. There was a lot of um, weird colors coming out of the nose and the mouth of the body. And as I looked at that, I was like, no, I don't want that. Why would I want that? And so he, he asked, well, I can help you go well, anywhere you want to go. So I said, well, I want to go wherever this, this love is coming from. The love that I'm feeling come from you, Drake. I want to go to that. And he explained that that love is coming from my home, that that's where I originally came from. And I can go back to that home if I want to. So that's where, where my, my journey begins is right there. He began to take me on this journey home. And when I say home, I mean like a different place than earth. But at the same time, it's, it's also right here. He was taking me to like this different dimension. Uh, and it felt like I was moving for a very long distance. But at the same moment, it was just moving to a much higher dimension. And that, that's very much what the, the illusion of distance that I was feeling, it was coming as we would pass through dimensions and, and go back home where we all come from. And as we were you know, on this journey, he, he helped me understand that there was quite a bit I didn't know. And for me to get into home or heaven, I had to learn a bit, I had to I just had to be willing to accept certain truths. And if I could accept these truths, he could help me get into heaven. He could help <laughs> me get into my home. And so we began this process. And it was, uh, I could speak for hours and hours just about the journey itself. But it was absolutely amazing. I, I was raised Christian, so I felt like I had some special VIP card for heaven. I thought for sure that that, oh, I've got it easy, Drake, you know, you can just let me in heaven. I am a Christian. And not only that, I have, you know, I had accepted Jesus as my savior. So I felt that like, I must be able to just get into heaven. And he, he loved that I was excited about that. But he explained that there was still a lot more that I had to understand. And one of the first things he, he helped me understand that I wasn't as authentic as I thought I was. I thought I was a pretty authentic person, but he helped me see that there was a different Vinny that would go to my parents' home, 
There was a different Vinny that would go to church once in a while. There was a different Vinny that would go on dates with girls and, and go on um, party nights with his friends. There was a different Vinny that would show up at the construction sites. There was a different Vinny that was a, you know, helping produce movies and TV shows. And it's like, you know, I had all these different aspects of who I was. And he helped me see that underneath all these different Vinnies was the core of who I really was. And that what I would do is as I would approach a certain event or a certain venue or a certain interaction, I would put up a mask and I would become who I thought I needed to become for, for where I was going. And he helped me understand that authenticity is, is really paramount for all of us on earth. And he helped me understand that without authenticity, I can't grow. And so I needed to find out who I authentically was first before I could actually start this process of growing and developing myself into someone who could be in heaven, who could be at this high level of love to get into heaven. So that was the first thing. And it was interesting because I thought for sure the first principle would be love, that love would be paramount. And it was funny because he said, yeah, love is paramount, but it's not the first thing. The first thing is authenticity. Because until you're authentic, you can't feel or give real love. And that was, a, that was an aha for me. That was a big wake up. Because I thought that for sure I could love others and I could receive love. But until I could authentically be me, I couldn't do either of those things. And that, that led me to the second principle that he taught me. You know, authenticity being the first thing. The second principle was um, understanding why we were there in, in earth. Why was I on earth? And he explained that, that all of us have chosen to be at earth. He calls it earth school because it is a school and it's always been a classroom. It's never been a courtroom that we've, we've elected to come here so that we can learn things. And that's what it's all about. It's not an end game. It's not, um, uh, it's not a Hail Mary. It's not a, it's not everything. Earth school is just that. It's school. It's not our whole life. Um, while we're here, we think it is. We think, you know, while we're here in earth school, we think that's all there is, that our whole universe is this life right now. And it's not. Um, we live a long time before we get here, and we're going to live for an eternity after we get here. So here is just a short little pit stop for us to learn some things. Um, so that was the second principle is to understand that we were in earth school and that this is an elective option for, for a soul, that if we wanna learn certain things, we go to one of the hardest schools and that's what earth school is. It's one of the hardest schools there is. And then that led me to the, the third principle, which the third principle is love everyone. And that until I could truly love everyone, I couldn't love myself. And, and at the same time, until I can love myself, I can't truly love anyone. So it, it starts with learning how to love yourself so that you can love others. And as you learn to love yourself, to truly love yourself, you can love others. And if you can give yourself unconditional love, you can give others unconditional love. But, you know, um, Drake taught me something. He called it the principle of the pointed finger. That as I could point love at, you know, authentic love at others, I'm pointing three times that love at myself. And I'm also pointing a, a portion of that love up to my creator, to my source. But at the same right, if I'm pointing negative energy at someone else, I'm pointing a portion of that negative energy up to God. And I'm pointing three times that, that portion back at myself. So for me to fully understand that principle of loving everyone, I had to realize that I needed to e express positive energy, love energy on all of my fellow beings. Even the ones I disagreed with. Even the ones that were in the opposite political party or the opposite NFL team or the opposite NBA team, you know. I had to love everybody. And... Um, that led me to the fourth principle. The fourth principle was that if I can truly love everyone, then I'm opening my heart up 
to receive an inner voice and that every one of us has a voice inside of us. And this inner voice, it runs off of love. It runs off of joy and love. And, and I don't mean gratification joy. I mean true joy, true and everlasting joy. And if we can get ourselves to feel love and joy, then we can receive an intuition, an inner voice. And that inner voice is essentially our connection to our creator. And that through that inner voice, we can be guided. And, you know, you, listening to that inner voice is, is paramount or, or fundamental for our success in earth school. And that led me to the fourth principle. The fourth principle is, or sorry, the fifth principle, because listening to your inner voice is the fourth. But the fifth principle is learning to use technology responsibly. Because if you do get access to that inner voice through love and joy, using technology, you can actually increase that love and joy, therefore increasing God's voice or, or your intuition inside of you. But at the same time, technology can be an absolute enemy to love and joy. And, and that would mean that we would have to harness or utilize a healthy relationship with technology. And if we learn to use technology responsibly, then it's going to allow us to go even that next step. And that next step is to release all prejudice. And, you know, I was raised in a biracial family, so I felt I was for sure not prejudiced at all. I felt I was probably one of the least prejudiced kids that I grew up with. And Drake showed me, he said, I'm so grateful that you are not prejudiced. But what do you think about prejudiced people? And I, I went off. I was like, I hate, I hate prejudiced people. They're so closed minded. They, they choose someone's lifestyle or their skin color or their religion, or they, they choose something small minded to to ostracize or push away another kind and it was so funny because drake showed me he showed me like an image of myself as the non-prejudice and he showed me as i'm sitting there like saying bad things about prejudiced people he like lifted me up and like you know metaphorically brought me over to the prejudice side and he helped me realize that by me hating prejudiced people i was prejudiced and that I was like, what? That was wow. that was so that was so outside of what I knew, but yet I knew it was true that I couldn't be prejudiced against anyone, even prejudiced people. Because if I am, I'm joining their ranks. And you know, to me, I think some of the most prejudiced are are just e evil leaders in from our history, you know. And I saw one of these leaders and I'm like, I'm not going to be anything like that person. And Drake helped me understand that by me hating them, I was becoming one of them. So that was another big one. And, and he brought me back to that principle of the pointed finger. That if I put out any type of hate towards even prejudiced people, I'm sending that hate back to myself. And he helped me understand that prejudiced people don't just wake up prejudiced. It doesn't happen. What happens is they wake up normal beings and they, they begin to get hurt by life and by other people. And over time, they start to, to build a false belief that it must be this certain type of person that is causing the pain. And so hurt people begin to hurt people. Healthy people, you know, healthy and happy people don't just wake up and become prejudiced. It doesn't happen. He showed me that it only happens when they are either trained or taught or hurt into becoming prejudiced. So I, I began to even see prejudice or, or prejudice in a new light and understand that if I really love God, my creator, that I had to love all of God's creations. That, you know, loving God's creations in, includes loving the beautiful flowers and the trees, but also loving the lion and the tiger that could eat you, right? But you're still going to love it all. You've got to love it all. And, and that was a big one for me that even though there were some lions and some tigers out there, 
I needed to love them just as much as the flowers and, and the trees and the beauty that God created. And that brought me to um, the seventh principle, which is the power of creation. And that if I really can release all prejudice, then I am now beginning to taste the power of creation. And, and what we have, all of us, is we all have these magic wands. Our magic wands allow us to create or destroy anything. And what those magic wands are, are our thoughts. If we can control our thoughts, then we can control our environment. And if we can control our environment, we can eventually control our life. Um, at first, it might not seem like that. But if we just try using our magic wands, using our thoughts to think positive things and to think in the positive throughout our life, we will end up creating a life full of gratitude, a life full of abundance, and a, a life full of love. And, and this power of, of creation is, is ours. And I don't care if you're born into a prison or if you're born into abundance already. You can lose it and you can, you can build it just as quick with your thoughts. So I, I was very interested in this aspect of using my thoughts to create. And, you know, Drake showed me that, you know, I had worked in construction before my experience. He showed me how someone might come upon some property and say, I want to build a building there. And it starts with that thought. Then they go and seek out an, an architect or an engineer, right? They get the, the plans drawn up. They get the plans approved. And then they take that to a builder and they actually start building a building. But it all started with the thought. And that inside of us, it's the same thing. We can build our world. We can build our life. We can build our paradigm. The way we view life beginning with our thoughts and how important it is for us to learn how to control our thoughts and to, to turn our thoughts into love, turn our thoughts into gratitude and abundance. And as we do that, we'll create, you know, gratitude and abundance in our life. Yeah. So, you know, understanding the power of creation is, is paramount and fundamental for our happiness in, in earth school. And if that, and if our thoughts are so important, then that leads me to the eighth principle, which is avoid negative influences. Because if your thoughts are so powerful, how important is it for us to recognize negative influences and to avoid them, right? And, and I'm going to take it even one step further. Rather than even just avoiding them, create positive influences or seek out positive influences. And in doing so, that's going to help us use our power of creation even better. So yeah, the eighth principle is, you know, avoiding negative influences and seek out positive influences. And that leads me to the, the ninth principle, which is there is purpose even in evil in this life. Because for us to grow, we need to have choices. And if all the choices are only good choices, there are no bad choices, then there is no growth. And having bad choices is like having weights at a gym. And it takes us sometimes making the bad choices or learning from others who have made those bad choices to learn uh, for ourselves how to make the good choices. And that it is vitally important for us to have what I was shown to be called free agency or the ability to make choices good and bad. And as we learn to choose good things, that strengthens our ability um, and our intention to, to choose good things. But as we make mistakes and we choose bad things, if we're learning from that, then even our bad, mis our bad choices can lead to growth and lead to uh, making ourselves better, better beings, better followers of our creator. And that, that led me to the last principle. And the last principle was and is that we are all one. All of us. It doesn't matter our it doesn't matter our color, our race, our our religion, our lifestyle, that we are all one, all of us. And that for me, to heart or to hurt 
or to harm another is no different than hurting or harming myself or one of my own children. And that for me, I have to understand that to truly understand God and love God, our creator, we have to, we have to love everyone. And, and you know, we are, if we're all one, that I, there's no such thing as a good war. There's no such thing as a good battle because we're only battling ourselves. That's it. And, you know, um, I've had this experience now. It's been over 20 years since my experience. And this is one that is even still hard for me today. Because we are living in this world full of ignorance and everybody's a victim. Everybody's a victim, but yet none of us are victims. And I'm telling you, like everywhere you go, you see people claiming that they're some type of victim. And everybody's a prima donna about what type of victimness that they have. And, and it's so sad because it's like putting a bunch of handcuffs on a table and asking someone, which handcuffs do you want to go put on? That's what victimhood is, is handcuffs. Victimhood is not anything to make you stronger, better, or more important. And in fact, it's the opposite. And, and the ability to be some type of victim is that it's, it's, it's an enslavement. You don't go around the world and find successful victims. You don't. You find, you find victims that have become successful by abandoning the victimhood mentality, by ab abandoning any type of victim that anyone was, right? And so it's important for us to understand in this life that we are all one, and that if there is one victim, we're all a victim. If there's one champion, we're all champion. And to love both aspects, to love the good, the bad, the ugly, we need to love it all. And as we do, we can take our victimhood handcuffs off. And we can allow ourselves to have the freedom to create what we want with our lives, using our magic wands, using our thoughts. We can really create the life that we want. And as I was going through this last principle with him, I actually started to see heaven. We touched down in heaven. We, I actually had my feet touch down in heaven. And I plugged wow. into this, gr this, this grass. And this grass was just, I don't even, it's, it's hard to even explain in words what this grass is because I felt like I always was supposed to meet that grass. As soon as I felt it, my, my feet came down and met the grass, but the grass came up and met my feet and we came together and I felt like I was finally home. I felt like my feet were always designed to be there, not here, there. And it's funny when people, you know, here on earth, they say, you need to be grounded. You need to be, you know, connected to mother earth. And I'm like, you have no idea. Like if we could even get a little bit of a feeling of what you get in heaven when you touch the mother earth there. You feel like it's part of you. You feel like you were the, the one who stepped away and now you're home. Now you're, you're where you always were before. And as I plugged into this grass, I actually could smell and, and hear, I could hear like this music. And it's, it's so beautiful because the music was not, something that I was even just hearing from outside me, I was hearing it from inside me. And I could feel this loving symphony coming up inside me. I could actually taste the sweetness of the grass just by touching it with my feet. I could feel every single blade of grass was a separate consciousness, a separate essence. And that all of these all of these things together were God, our creator, that the grass itself was the consciousness of God, our creator. And so I, I, I get, again, I could talk for hours and hours just about the grass, but I felt this, as I touched this grass, I felt this form of love I had never felt before. 
And this form of love, mm -hmm. it came in, it poured in on me, and it started to heal me. It started to heal me in a way that I didn't know I needed healing. Um, now, you know, speaking earlier about victims, I was, I was a victim of abuse most of my life and um, all sorts, like all sorts of abuse. And so I had a lot of cracks. I had a lot of uh, brokenness on me. And this grass started to bring this loving energy from the, the, the planet of heaven or from the space of heaven and bring it into me and heal me. And as I was getting so giddy and excited about this grass, Drake was, was kind of laughing because I was so excited and I thought this is so amazing. And he, he's like, you think the grass is good? Look at the flowers. And I was like, there's flowers. Oh my gosh, there's flowers. So he, he brought my energy over to the flowers. And now it was like grass times a billion. It was even stronger, the amount of love and beauty and sweetness and music that was coming from the flowers. And then again, Drake was laughing and he's like, you think the flowers are good? Check out the trees. And, and instantly my consciousness was like plugged in and I was feeling the majesty and almost like the teamwork of the trees, how they all work together, they network to each other and how each and every tree was so vitally important to the whole network of trees. And as this was all happening, then I actually felt the consciousness of the water come to me. And I felt the water ask me, do you want us on you? And I said, yes, I do want you on me. And, and so the water came up, started with my toes and it came up, it came up over my toes and actually just started to climb up my body. And as it did, it, it again, helped complete that healing process of healing me from all the trauma and the harm that my life had, had kind of put onto me. And so I, I got the most tremendous feeling of healing from this water. It felt like any little crack that I had ever had in me, in my heart, in my being, that every little crack was filled with this tremendous unconditional love. And I could feel this beautiful sense that, that there was way more love than I could have ever deserved here. And I had that thought. I had that thought, like, you don't deserve this love, but yet it's here. And, and right as I had that thought, I felt the consciousness of the water say, we're here for you, all of us. We're here for you. And that's when I realized that heaven is a space that has been created for each and every one of us. And there's nothing we could do to deserve it. Nothing. There's no amount of good deed um, that we could do to deserve this tremendous gift of what heaven is. And as this is all happening, I see that there's this building. And it's, it's pretty far off. And I'm getting very interested in this building. And as I am getting interested, Drake notices that I'm getting interested in the building. He starts telling me a little bit about it. I start understanding what it is. But as this is happening, he, he gives me this sense that my time is short and that we've got to hurry and we've got to do something. So he steps in front of me. He steps in front of my consciousness and he puts his arm forward onto my shoulder and he he looks at me dead in the eyes. And again, his eyes, I swear to you, they're like little lassos. Like they could just go in and lasso you and like draw you in. So I'm staring at him. He's staring at me. And he says, Vinny, this is going to be very hard. It's going to be really hard. But it's going to be worth it. And as he did that, he brought me in for a hug. And this is something that, that we have nothing like this hug in, in earth, nothing. It's better than anything you can experience on earth. But he brought his, his being together with my being, and we actually became one being, one being of light. 
And as we did, it felt like we became a pulsar. I felt this like expansion, like boom, like a huge boom of expansion. And I felt me as a being, as a consciousness, I went way outside myself with my own energy. And I felt safe doing that because I had come together with Drake. And as this was happening, I started to hear loud in my ear, I could hear my, my earth brother's words. And what had happened, you know, I had actually, I had actually died. My body was brought back, but I was still brain dead for three days. So I went in the hospital brain dead on January 18th. I woke up on January 21st. And what had happened is my brother was saying a special prayer over my body. And this is my birth brother. He was saying a special prayer over my body. As he got done with this special prayer, he said, amen. He concluded that prayer. And with the conclusion of that prayer, I felt a rip. I felt a tear. I felt that I was pulled away. I was pulled away from Drake. I was pulled away from heaven. I was instantly forced back to my body. And to me, it was instantaneous. I, I felt him say amen. And then bam, I woke up in my body. Um, in the real world sense of things, he actually had said the blessing or the prayer over my body at about 10 p.m. And I woke up at 1.11 in the morning. So from 10 p.m. until 1.11 in the morning, that was me transitioning back from heaven. And it seemed instantaneous. It really did seem instantaneous. I made it all the way back um, to my body. I woke up. It was again at 1.11 in the morning. I felt extremely claustrophobic. So the first thing I did is I unplugged everything off of me. I had IVs in both arms. I had um, uh, tubes coming out of my face. I pulled everything out. I had a catheter in my urethra. I, I pulled everything out. I didn't want anything touching me. So I stood there for a few moments and realized that I was naked. And, and also that there was all these machines. They were making these loud alarm noises. So first things first, I went and unplugged all the machines. Anything that had a plug on it, I unplugged it. I didn't want anything that was making any noise around me. And then I went rifling through the cupboards to try to find um, a, something to wear because I, I recognized that I was naked. So I, I grabbed a couple of gowns. I wrapped them around myself. And I went directly out of my, my hospital bedroom and went directly to the right. Somehow I knew that's where the elevator was. And I just, I pretty much went to a jog all the way down to the elevator. And I was hitting the down button when I heard a scream. And the scream was a nurse. She had gone in my room to check on why everything had flatlined, everything, all the, all the sensors and, and equipment had gone down. So when she went in there and saw there was nobody there, so she screamed. She was like the loudest scream. And then um, I, I turned and I saw that, that she was in my room. And another nurse came running in and, and both of them came out and they saw me standing there holding the gowns around my midsection and they both screamed. And at that moment, I knew I needed to come back. I didn't want to get them in trouble. So I, I came back. I told them I wanted to go home. They told me I couldn't go home, that I had to get the doctor's approval. I had to get many medical departments approval before I could just be cleared to go home. So I began that process. And from 11, you know, from the, the early hour of one in the morning, all the way till about 7 a.m., I was filling out paperwork. I was signing paperwork. I was doing test after test after test. And I passed all the tests that they had for me. There were certain tests I wouldn't do. I was just like, I don't need that test. But, but everything that they forced me to do, I took their test. I passed it well enough that I could leave on my own recognizance. And uh, right at 7.30 in the morning, my father came by and he was able to pick me up and take me home. And that's, that's where, you know, my experience begins. My experience has had quite a few things happen since. And um, six months after my experience, I was in this little town in Wyoming. And I saw this, this history presentation 
about the history of the town of Afton, Wyoming. And one of the first clergy in that area was this man named Charles Kazare. And when his picture came up on the screen at this presentation, um, my, my, my wife, she, she was my fiance at the time, she pointed out, she's like, that's your guy. That's the guy who you, you mm -hmm. tell me about all the time. That's the guy who is leading you through heaven. That's your guide. And I wasn't looking and paying attention, really. I, I was like, that's not him. And I looked up. And as soon as my eyes caught the, his eyes in the picture, I just froze. I froze. I started huh. to get cold. I started to shake. I started to have this, this thing come over me. And, and it was really, really odd because now what was possibly a delusion, it was now real. But here was the weird part. It said his name was Charles. It didn't say his name was Drake. But I recognized the last name. I recognized it was the same as my, my grandmother's maiden name. So we went directly to my grandmother's house. And I said, I said, Grandmother, I need to know about this Charles Kazare. And her exact words were, oh, you mean great grandpa Drake. I can tell wow. you all about him. Yeah, and she, she mentioned that he was kind of famous in the family. That in the Kazare family, he was kind of famous because he helped establish a lot of different aspects of Wyoming um, in, in the, the land. He helped survey the land. He also was one of the first clergy in the, in the territory. So it was really neat. I got to learn that his middle name was Drake. His first name was Charles. And that only his friends could call him Drake. And he kept it that way so that if somebody called him Charles, he knew it was somebody who was professional and something about business or about the, the state of Wyoming or maybe about church. Um, but if somebody called him Drake, he knew, oh, they're family, they're friends, they're, they're some of my personal connections. So it's really neat that even, even to the name, that I even had the name right, even though on official records, it was all, it was all Charles D. Kazare, not Charles Drake Kazare, it was just Charles D. So mm -hmm. later come to find out through grandmother, um, his middle name is Drake and was Drake. And, uh, you know, I've had many confirmations since, not just that one, but that was one of the, I, I joke around, that was the one that kind of put the nail in the coffin for me, that I couldn't, I couldn't pretend that this was some kind of delusion. I couldn't pretend that it was my imagination. I had to accept that this was real and I had to learn how to live with it. And so that's what I've been doing now for you know almost 21 years now. I've been learning to live with that. I work with spirit all the time, every single day. Um, am I perfect at it? Not even close, but I, I work really hard at it. Um, and spirit is a, a part of my daily life. Every single day of my life, I work with spirit. And it's what I do. I actually, I, I coach people. I help people learn about their own intuition. I help them strengthen their intuition and develop it at the same time as I, I am a life coach. So I help people learn about their own life and their own goals and how to achieve those goals. You know, not just utilizing what I learned, but utilizing what I've learned since as well. So that's, that's yeah. my story. That's my experience. And um, yeah, it, it's a little bit of a, um, a crazy one because I was, I was woken up out of a body bag. That's, you don't have a lot of those, but you'd be surprised how many there are, though. There is a lot of them out there. There's not a ton, but there is a lot of us out there that were woken up out of body bags. Yeah. Yes. I think what's really, there, there are a lot of things that are very interesting about your story. And I've, I've heard your story on a couple of different podcasts, and I've also listened to your book on Audible. And every time I hear it, I feel this like overwhelming sense of emotion. And then now with you talking about it again, <laughs> it kind of felt like I was listening to it again for the first time. I, I mean, dare I say that whatever love you experienced while you were with Drake and yeah. probably still experience now while you work with Spirit... Yep. I definitely think there's a residue that is very much on you because it's very potent whenever, you know, it you is. talk about your story and, and sitting in front of you now, hearing it from you. I was trying so hard not to get emotional as you were talking <laughs> because it was affirming for 
so many reasons, but I want to start off with the guy who, the the medic who woke you up, who yeah. was relentless and, you know, listened to his intuition, which was really loud, which was screaming at him. And even though he had just started, he still wanted to make sure that, you know, he defied what his um, yeah, senior he broke colleagues. Yeah, yeah, he broke protocol. And that was a very, like emotionally charged part for me because if he didn't do that oh yeah you probably wouldn't be I here wouldn't, yeah. i'd be i'd be on the good side of things the you know in heaven where <laughs> where i where i pretty much prefer to be most of the time <laughs> yeah and i and i think another part of your story too you know as i was listening to your book you said that you kind of struggled a little bit when you um, after you came back and you were in your body because yeah. after experiencing all the love and peace on the other side and then having to kind of get back into the body, which is very restricting, um, and live this human life, which is designed to be very challenging and painful. Can yep. you just talk a little bit about how you were able to kind of move past that? Or do you still find yourself struggling sometimes to really so, be uh, present in the human experience? In in total authenticity, I'm going to be honest with you. I still struggle with it, but but mm -hmm. that's understandable. Most of us who have been there, so been to heaven, most of us, and I and I say most because there's a few out there that they may think they went to heaven, but but as soon as they start talking about heaven, I can tell you instantly if they've actually been there or not, mm -hmm. because it's like you said, that love energy is tangible. It is physical. Even for me talking about the simple, basic version of what heaven is, it's so tangible, people do feel it. And, you know, anybody who's actually been there, we do have a hard time. It's almost like you were born into a cage, into solitary confinement with handcuffs on your hands and your, and your, your legs, right? And someone takes you out of all that allows you to go to Disneyland for a day and then says, okay, time to get back in the cage. That's yes. what it feels like. That's the, I mean, it's, it's, it's of course not that it's actually way, way bigger than that, but right. that's kind of the understanding of if for people to understand what this is, is it is really hard to come back here, but here's what you do is you for me, I've figured out little places where I'm able to see and connect to my creator. And, and one of those th ways is through my kids and through my wife. Um, she was one of the first people who um, kind of saved me off of the suicide list because I saw, I saw heaven in her eyes. I saw the light of God in her eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's not just me. Uh, random little children just run up to her and give her hugs all the time because she's, she holds the joy of heaven in her. and. It's one of those things that it keeps me here. It, you know, knowing that it's there and I get to go back, I want to make sure I go back the right way. So yeah, I, it, it isn't easy, but it's definitely worth it. Just like Drake said, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. You know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And another thing too, is like you said that you were a Christian before you, you know, had that near death experience yes. mm -hmm. and from, you know, what you talked about and just, you know, in listening to your book when, um, you know, you talk about earth being a school and, and sorts, did you ever, have you thought about reincarnation for yourself? Because I know that's not a Christian doctrine, for example. So are there mm -hmm. some spiritual doctrines or teachings that don't necessarily apply to Christianity, but you kind of now understand well, to be true? Here's the one thing is anybody who says there is no reincarnation or who says there is unequivocally there is, um, you can't be speaking for everyone because God's the creator. Mm -hmm. God is the creator and the creator is not going to be bound by our beliefs or disbeliefs and whatever is, is. And us believing one way or another is not going to change whatever is. But here's what I can tell you is the soul has lived eternally before this mm -hmm. and it will live eternally after this. And most Christians, and I can, I can say myself included, almost all Christians believe in a pre-mortal life, a life yes. 
in the spirit world. Um, and then they also believe in a post-mortal life, right? So right there, there's three lives, pre-mortal, mortal, and post-mortal, right? So even Christians, we believe that there's at least three lives that we live. We live pre-mortal, we live mortal, and we live post-mortal or heaven life, right? So, uh, but here's the funny thing. If that's going to keep you out of heaven, you've got some problems. You don't need to be going and fighting anybody on whether reincarnation exists or not. Because here's the thing. I've actually worked with souls and spirits where I could pick up um, previous history on them. It doesn't mean that they were necessarily reincarnated, but it means that there's something there. And I don't understand what it is. And only God does. Yeah. And that's what it's really about, is we don't need to figure it all out. What we do need to know is there, there is a, a creator that loves us so much and has so much powerful love for us. And if we could tap into a little bit of that love, our life becomes so much easier, so much better. And we're not going to tap into that love arguing whether reincarnation is or not is, you know? Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I asked that question because, you know, one of the reasons I love listening to near-death experiences and, and why I got into it, you know, so many years ago um, is because I've always had a sense ever since I was younger, I would go outside and sit on my porch and look up at the sky and just be like, where am I? Like, what is the point of this? I've yeah, always had exactly. that inquisitive nature. And mm -hmm. I've always known that it's just what we see in our physical world is not just it. And I felt like the way people were looking at life and perceiving things was just so limited. So I started becoming obsessed with near-death experiences because I felt like these stories were kind of validating a lot of the ideas I already had in terms of reincarnation, in terms of life, you know, what is life after death and just understanding what the purpose of, you know, life is. So everything you're saying makes a, a whole lot of sense to me. Something else you talked about in your book, which I was very intrigued by, was the whole concept of the devil. Because that's something mm -hmm. I'm trying to, you know, understand. Because people talk about the devil a lot. And sometimes I'm like, is it a fear tactic? Does the devil actually exist as a entity? Or is it more of an energy, that energy of hate and um, division. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts more on yeah. So on that to answer to answer that um, is there a devil? Yes, there is a devil. Um, is it mm -hmm. the energy of hate and loathing and anger and fear? Yes, it's all of those things. And essentially, to me, the way that it was shown to me is the the top of Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder is our ability to ascend to heaven, to be with our creator, to be with our father in heaven, right? And at the top of Jacob's ladder is God, our creator, our source. And at the bottom of the ladder, the furthest distance from God is Satan or the devil, right? Um, the different cultures have different names. But here's the crazy thing. If God built the ladder, he built the top rung and the bottom rung and all the mm -hmm. rungs in between. But here's what's crazy. There's an elevator button on that ladder, and the up button is love, and the down button is fear, anger, loathing, uh, victimhood. Oh, victimhood is like a, an accelerator you can push to get you lower. And, and it's really amazing to me that when we push the love button, and we actually find ways to love others, not to love ourselves, but to love others, we learn how to love ourselves. And as we can really love ourselves, we can go so much faster towards our, our creator. And it is, it is all about that. That's why we come to earth school is to learn how to push those buttons. And, and that's really mm -hmm. what it is because here's, here's what happened um, in our pre-existence or in our existence before earth, before we came to earth school, we're mm -hmm. around God. We're part of God. We're, we're a piece of him, but we're also our own consciousness. And, and we're sitting there trying to grow and develop. But what we realized is our creator is so powerful and so full of love. Anything that the creator wants, we all want. So we, it's almost like we can't have independent thought from our creator. So we, we all voted. We got before God and we said, hey, we want to grow. 
And God's like, hey, the only way you can grow is you got to leave home. Because if you're always here with me, you guys love me so much. Anything I want, you automatically want. Anything I need, you automatically need. So it's, yeah, we're, we become so entranced by the love that we have for our creator that for us to learn, we have to step away from that love. And not just mm-hmm. that, we have to step through a veil of forgetfulness because that love is so strong that if we, even if we can remember that love, it will still impact our choices here. So yes, that's why we're here. We're here to go through that veil of forgetfulness and to be at a, we, we climb to the bottom of Jacob's ladder where we have a lot of fear. We have a lot of other things, but we have the force of love. We have the force of light and it can lift us up. It can raise us up closer to our creator. And every single day we have that choice. We can choose love over fear. We can choose empowerment over victimhood. And as we do that, we become the masters of our own domain. We become the masters of our own, of our own future. We get to choose where and what we do, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's funny though, because so much of religion is to try to teach you the ways to do this, but it's very, very simple. Choose love, get closer to God. And now I don't, I don't say choose gratification. I don't choose, I don't say choose power. I mean, choose love, true love. And, and if you don't know what that is, go serve people. If, if you're missing anything in this life, go give other people what you're missing and you will actually receive exactly what you need. Mm-hmm. And that's what this whole life is about. It's a, it's a chance to learn, to make choices, to, ch- to push those buttons. And sometimes we might accidentally bump that fear button. We might bump that anger button. And if we're human, we're going to. It's natural. Yes. But it's what we do with that. It's what we do after we, we step out and realize, oh, I didn't mean to be here. You know, it's what we do there. That's what counts. Yeah. I like the analogy that you gave about the, the different um, levels and the elevator analogy that you gave. Yeah. Because it, cause you're right. I do think that God is the creator of, of everything, really. So mm-hmm. does a hell, so you talked about heaven and you talked about different types of heaven, heavens. There are multiple heavens. So yep. in talking about the the devil, is there a hell? Because a lot of people will say hell does not exist and nobody really goes to hell. I mean, depending on how your soul is evolving, if you're evolving to be more of a negative person, then you might yeah. be in a in a negative realm or you might, you know, have that experience, but a hell does not exist is, I don't know if you have any clarity on that. I have to kind of eat my own words because I, I've, I've told a lot of people over the years, there is no hell. The, in fact, the only hell that exists is, is here, but, but really here's Mm -hmm. what hell is. Hell is not a place. It is a state of being and we can find hell here. And we can find hell anywhere. But at the same time, we can also find heaven here. It's our choice. And, and really, the only hell that exists. And, it, you know, talking to, I've talked to hundreds of near-death experiencers now over the years. And talking with all of them, I, I've come to my own consensus, my own understanding, that any of these experiencers that experienced a hell they were experiencing it while they were doing the life review. They were doing a, re- a okay. review of their own life and seeing all the mistakes that they made. Now, what happens though, if they get stuck focusing on all the mistakes they made, it would feel like it's hell for sure. But it's never permanent ever because the second they yell out for God or they yell out for Jesus or they yell out for the um the prophet Muhammad, or they yell out for whoever they're yelling for in deity form, then God shows up. No matter who they're calling for, God shows up and pulls them out of that hellish condition. But that hell is is a state of being. It's not a place. It is a state of yes. being. And we can be at hell um, or heaven here on earth. It's our choice, though. Here's the thing. We can think that everybody's out to get us, and guess what? 
we're going to believe everybody's out to get us. And guess what? Eventually, everybody's going to be out to get us. So, you know, it's, it's so important for us to understand the power of our thoughts. If we believe the world wants us to succeed, and we really believe that, eventually the world will want us to succeed. It doesn't change whether they actually are or not. If we believe it, we can achieve it. And that's, and you know, there's been many yes. thought masters and many um, te teachers and, and, you know, prophets from the past who have taught us that very same thing. Knock and, and it shall be opened unto you. So knock on fear and fear shall be opened unto you. Knock on love and mm -hmm. abundance and love and abundance will be opened unto you. So it's, it's very important for us to learn from the holy words through scripture through ancient writings, through through the the truths that God has put on earth from long ago. And we can learn from that very much today as they did, you know, 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago. Um, it's just as important today. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I think there's another verse in the Bible that says, ask and you shall receive. And I remember my theology teacher in high school, mm -hmm. he, I remember he, he said, he, he said, heaven is on earth. And I thought, because I'm very much into these things, I thought, what does that mean? And after years of my own spiritual work and journey, I realized that it's in the mind. Heaven or hell really is a state of being. It, is. it starts it's in the mind. with the thoughts and, mm -hmm. and the feelings that you have in your mind. And another thing that I loved in your book, as you were talking about the different principles, and I, I think it was the principle on us being one or it's either the principle about loving others where we talked about how different religions as far as they're preaching the truth because obviously we know that religions have been you know tainted depending on how people you know um yeah. interpret the teachings of of god drake had said that um all religions are valid that mm -hmm. preach love and i thought i've mm -hmm. always felt that way and it was just really, really, again, affirming hearing that from your uh, story. Yeah. And, and that's one thing that I, I really was amazed because when I was in the actual place of heaven, it was full of all sorts of cultures and colors and religions. It was full. And how yes. amazing that was to me that there was this, this, place of unconditional love and that place of unconditional love was truly for all of us and that our religion could either uh, embolden us and empower us or it could imprison us but it's the love that that lets you choose which of those it is if we choose the the fear path with religion we become imprisoned by our religion if yes. we choose the love path, we become empowered. And I believe it with every fiber of my being that is, if we use that power of love, it goes beyond religion. It, it helps us exit that religion into, into God's kingdom. Yes. You know, as I was listening to you talk about love, and I'm a big believer in love, I one of my main missions about, you know, the work that I do in podcasting is to spread love and spread understanding and give people new perspectives on life and, and how they view the world. But, you know, sometimes I even think for myself, too, how can we love someone who, you know, is just so obviously what we would consider to be evil, right? When we think about people who hurt little kids, for example, people who walk into a mall or a school and just start shooting and, you know, how is it possible? How can we create a space where we obviously want to hold people accountable for their actions? How do we hold people accountable and still love them? Because I think sometimes for me, I'm like, well, if I'm so loving, then I might be so quick to forgive and I might not want to hold people accountable for atrocities that they're committing. So do you hear people ask that question? And, and do you think about that for yourself? Like, how is it possible to love people who are so hard to love? Well, the, the thing is love and justice can coexist. Okay. They can love and justice can coexist. Um, 
just because someone is being served with justice doesn't mean you can't love them. You can. And in fact, um, a, a, an inspiring woman to me has completely adopted her son's murderer. And I have watched so much Christ-like love, God-like love being shown by her as she has fully adopted her own son's murderer because she realized that the murderer of her son was just a lost little boy. And so rather than only seek the justice path, She's allowed the justice to serve, but she herself has, has superseded that justice with eternal justice of love. Mm. And how she has done more honor to her son's sacrifice by loving her murderer than ever by, by doing what she also could have done was relish in his in life imprisonment, relish in his failures. She has taken the, the complete highest path possible on this earth, and that is love. There is no higher path than love. We can yes. love those who hurt us, and we can love them through that hurt and help them understand how they hurt us. And then we can help love them into a loving place. But here's the thing. It's like what I said in the beginning. Um, hurt people hurt people. People don't just set off being strong and healthy and loved and decide to start hurting others. They do it because they're hurting themselves. So what we need to do is we need to go back to where the hurting starts, and that's in the home or the lack of a home. That's where the hurting starts, and that's where we as a society need to start loving and caring about each other. Yes. Our, our world used to have a, a culture that... We were raised by our communities and that if, you know, mom had a hardship, the community would step in and take over for mom. If dad had a hardship, the community would step in and take over for dad. And these communities, they work together to raise the children. And that's, that's the future of the world. That's where the future lies. We, now, we've got some big growing pains to get through before we get there. But mark my words, there will be a day where, where the, the light and the love of God permeates this planet, permeates it everywhere. And as it does, we will be communities. We will be communities of love. We will be communities of light. We won't be major cities like we have now, but we will be communities, little nest eggs of light and love where we take complete care of each other. No matter what our background is, no matter what mom and dad do, we take care of each other. And that it's those communities that prevent monsters from being grown. Yes. It is. Because monsters are grown in the dark. Monsters are grown with, with, with abuse and in the dark. And if you bring light to, to the hearts of the world, you, you, you squash those monsters. And you squash them with love. And you allow that, that divine, that divinity that's within all of us to arise and to grow and to become what we're supposed to become. And that's a divine masterwork. Every single one of us is a divine masterwork. In God's eyes, every one of us, from the greatest to the worst of us, we are a divine masterwork. And we're just here to learn. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and grow towards love. It's it's beautiful yeah. that you just said that because I was going to ask too because you and Drake talked about how they're different planets with different yeah. beings on them. You know, that's one of the conversations that's yeah. in, you know, has hit mainstream media now which talks about aliens and, you know, beings or intelligent life and different forces and Drake had said some a lot of, you know, different beings are way more advanced than we are obviously some are not as advanced as we yep. are and i was going to ask like and there's there's just so many out there there's more than you could even possibly fathom or think of yeah and in fact one a term a term that's used in the bible all the time is there's more sands in the sea and that's that's what the the kind of terminology they showed me is there's more sands in the sea 
uh, or there's more creations out there of life than there is sands in all of our seas combined. Yes. There's so much life. And in fact, the life in the universe, life itself, intelligent life, it permeates the entire universe. Everywhere you look, there is intelligent life. It's just we haven't been looking the right way. We've been looking in the dark and not the light. In the light, yes. you'll see the intelligence everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so based on everything you've been saying, would you say the next stage in humanity is to really grow towards love? Because right now we are very much focused on technology and dominance and power. Do you well, think that there's a shift watch, happening? There is. There's an energetic apartheid happening right now. Mm. And the apartheid was the separation, right? We're watching an energetic separation happen as we speak. People are getting more and more addicted to their technology. We will see in the next year or two, society will cross the barrier of technology and, and biology. They're going to be putting the technology inside the body, and this will only increase the enslavement. It's, not, it's going to be even more convenient. It is going to make things... It, the way it's going to be pitched to us, it's going to be pitched to us to help us overcome certain health conditions. But I'm telling you, mm -hmm. like anything we need, we can get from our creator. We can. And uh, we don't need to necessarily uh, get our answers from technology because eventually the technology will try to replace God. It will try to replace deity. And it will get so strong that people won't trust intuition anymore. And in fact, they won't, they won't even ask intuition. They will only ask Google. They will only ask their technology. And they will only trust what they see or read in the technology. So eventually, the technology replaces God for many people. But you will see a, re a renaissance of people stepping away from technology. And even you will see communities starting to form in the next three years these communities will start with the whole idea of no Wi-Fi, like no Wi-Fi. Can you believe, can you imagine that? Like no internet in oh, the wow. entire community. And in fact, to use internet, you have to go to these you have to go to these special energetic protected spaces for you to use internet. There's going to be communities like this starting to pop up in the next three years, and this is a big deal. People are they understand that technology is imprisoning them and it's enslaving, it's enslaving them. And they know that. And if you don't think you're enslaved by your technology, do a one day technology fast. That means don't use your technology at all for an entire day, 24 hours. And That's if you hard. can do that and yeah. keep a smile on your face, then maybe, then maybe you're not, maybe you're not enslaved to your technology, but most people and myself included, you can't do that. You can't. And so it's important for us to understand that technology will try to replace, you know, they talk about uh, the Antichrist as being a silver-tongued serpent. And this is the silver-tongued mm. serpent in the back pocket of everyone. Everyone has technology. From the richest to the poorest of us, we all have technology. That is the access that, that fear has to us. And here's what's crazy. How hard is it to find a video about fear? It's not hard at all. Look anywhere you want, any mm. service, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of the news, it's full of fear, full of it, okay? Now reverse that. How hard is it to find something about love? It's actually quite hard. And you have to be very dedicated to trying to find love energy on the technology. And I don't mean, you know, singles.com or something like that. I mean actual love energy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You're, you're not right. You're right. It. It's, it's really hard to find. And, and that's the thing. How, lo how many years do you need 1,000% access to fear and 0% access to love before you realize you're being programmed to only be led by fear? And that's what this is. Yes, you're right. I, I mean, it. I even, I'm obviously, I'm very much addicted to my phone, but I realized that I have to be we very, all are. very, we all are. yeah, yeah. I have to be very careful about the content that I, you know, 
pay attention to because like you know, I'm very sensitive to energy as well. And, you know, when I see, you know, you turn on the news, if you follow CNN or any of the major news outlets, it's like bad news after bad news after bad news. I mean, these things are happening in the world, but I always, you know, when I check into myself, I'm like, I feel horrible. I'm on edge. I'm anxious. I'm, you know, looking at people sideways. I'm filled with a lot more stress, anxiety, fear, and, you know, prejudice towards people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're constantly consuming that, even during COVID, I just turned off the news. I didn't even pay attention to it at all because I you could just see yeah. what it was feeding in my spirit. Mm -hmm. I remember and, the first time mm -hmm. I went out for a, a walk on a sunny day, and this was during COVID. And I'm, I was looking around I'm like, wow, there's no COVID out here. There's just normal life. The sun, the birds aren't wearing masks, right? The little hummingbird that feeds in my backyard, he's not wearing a mask. Right. Like, like there was no COVID. There was no fear, right? And so that's when I realized that I needed to get outside as, as often as possible. But, you know, in a joking way, I was listening to a news program. This was a few years ago. And they, they said, we have great news and we're going to announce at, after the break. They came back after the break and they said, the great news is we caught that murderer. Well, and it's like, what? That's not, I mean, I mean, that's justice news, but that's not that's good not news. That's not great good news. news, yeah. Would be, you know, the energy of good. And I'm glad that they caught whatever, you know, but, but here's the thing. That is not good news. It's not good news is, you know, people were able to be saved or people were able to be rescued or people were be able to be served or loved um, or brought resources that they didn't have before. That's good news. And somehow our modern world doesn't know what good news is. They don't. No. And it's no, so weird, don't. this new resurgence. I'm seeing, I'm seeing like this resurgence online of these, these preachers who give away money. And mm. it's so weird to me because they, they themselves do not embody the light energy or the love energy. And they're going around giving away money. And, and what's weird, though, is a lot of the backstories that are now coming out about these people that you find out that most of the setups were actually that, setups, and yeah. that they were paid actors a lot of the time, and only a few times were actually people being helped. And, and so, you know, we can't believe everything we see, but that's why it's important to have that intuition, because from day one, one of these people, I watched this video, and I'm like, no, not real. I knew from the very second, and not until seven years later, and he had this huge empire of, of money coming in from YouTube, did the world recognize that this guy was, was not legitimate, that there was something off about him, and now all these true stories are coming out. So it's, you know, here's what we got to do. We've got to develop that intuition. We've got to strengthen it because it's going to keep us on track, and it's also going to give us reminders, hey, You've spent too much time on your phone today. St you know, put the phone down and go spend time with your children, and and make them put their phones down too, because everybody's got the phones, everybody's got the iPads and the and and the entertainment devices. Put them all down and spend some time together. Love each other. This is the holidays. This is the time where we get to show how much we love each other with our service to each other, and with the, our kind gestures to each other. So choose to do that without the technology if you can. Yeah. Yes, because like you said, I think I whenever I'm on social media, I'm like, this is not a real place. This is not reality. And because we're constant, constantly no. like this, yeah. sometimes I have to check myself because I'm starting to feel like what's on my phone is the real world. Like what you talked about with going outside during COVID and hearing the birds mm -hmm. chirp and realizing, well, there isn't, you know, hysteria around me. There's no COVID around me right no. now. and in that there's sense. no fear there's the no animals fear. weren't fearful yeah yeah there's no fear and i think yeah. when you feed into fear sometimes like you said our thoughts and and what we feed into becomes a self-fulfilling um prophecy and a lot of times people just perform online you know to get the views to get the love to get the money they do. And we, they we do. all have to be very careful of that and even speaking about intuition you know with technology there are a lot of pros to technology right because for example you and i are having this conversation and you're in Arizona, if I yes, am correct. Yes, this is a miracle. And I'm, yes, I this it. is a miracle. I'm in, yeah, so, yeah, in Vegas. Yeah. 
Oh, it is. awesome. Yeah. And and I'm over here close to DC. I'm in Northern Virginia and we're having this amazing conversation. But also I think with the mm-hmm. one of the cons of technology is we're losing connection to each other. And like you said, we're losing connection to ourselves. And this this push and obsession yeah. with technology and science, which I think is good because I think science and technology, they're trying to understand I think they're instruments to understand God, but really and truly God is so much bigger than that. Well it's it's funny. I was I was told by Drake that if I want to see my future, I need to look to my past. And mm-hmm. if I want to see my past, I need to look to my future. And and he was talking about humanity. And he was showing me that, you know, we think that we've mastered technology and we've gotten it to the to the to the greatest level it's ever been. We're completely off target because the world has seen even greater technology than us before. Yes. It has. And if you go back to the, the ancient time periods where they had even greater technology than now, if we if we would be honest about that, then we would have to admit that there is some type of sabotage that this technology is going to do to us. Um, or we become so reliant that once it's wiped out, the technology itself, we're, we we walk around not knowing what to do with ourselves and we just starve and die, you know? Um, but I'm telling you, it's it's really a beautiful thing to realize that God has a connection to us better than Wi-Fi. Yeah. And that connection is direct. We don't need a device. And that connection is direct into our heart. And the stronger that connection is, the more we are plugged into what where we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what this life is all about is working yes. together with God to get the best we can out of this life. And then we can go home. We can graduate from earth school and we can go home and be proud of what we learned here and realize yes. that, you know, we made it out of earth school, the, the classroom. And it, again, it never was that courtroom. It never was that garbage can. God was never throwing away souls into earth. God was sending them here to learn and to grow. And that's what yeah. it's all about. So let's learn and grow. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And just one last thing I, I wanted to just round this up with is the that first principle, because I think being authentic, when you allow yourself to be authentic, you out, allow yourself to connect with your true self and also indirectly connect with source and connect with God. And in your book, Drake gave the example of and I think you talked about it too earlier in your story is that, you know, we wear different masks in different social um, settings. And what we need to do is bring our whole self to the table, not try to sanitize who we are at our core. So can you just yeah. talk about that a little bit? How do we embrace our authenticity and really be okay with who we are at our core? So I always ask myself, am I okay being myself, my real self, mm-hmm. around this particular group of people? And if I feel like I'm not okay with that, I need to do one of two things. I need to figure out why. What what vulnerability am I trying to run away from? Mm-hmm. Or I need to choose a new group of friends. That's it. Because we need to be authentic everywhere we go. There's only one reason we would not be authentic, and that's vulnerability. But guess what? Vulnerability is actually where we grow in this life. When we find vulnerability, we're finding learning opportunities and growing opportunities. And to not have any vulnerability is to lie to ourselves. So you see these people, you know, uh, blinging their life in front of other people. They are trying to convince the world that they are successful. The only reason they're doing that is because in their heart, they don't feel successful. Because someone who is truly successful in this life They don't need to bling. They don't need to fake. They don't need to impress. They just need to show up. And as they show up as their authentic self, that happiness, that success is seen and felt without a bunch of whatever to show it, you know? And and what we need to realize is we have that power or we have that weakness. We can show up and be ourselves. And where we find any vulnerability, recognize it as an opportunity to grow. And when we don't find any vulnerability, 
we can understand, hey, I'm being authentic with this authentic group of people who love me. And that's a, that's a match made in heaven right there. That's, that's your people. That's your, that's your culture. That's your, that's your community. And that's what we need a lot more of. Because if you can't be yourself, don't yeah. be there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and like you said in the book, um, you can't really be loved or receive love if you're not your true self. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. Um, people yeah. that um, ha- people that habitually have a hard time finding real love, it's because they don't love themselves. That's why. Has nothing to do mm-hmm. with loyal or not loyal people around them. It has everything to do with I don't love myself. That's why I'm trying to find my happiness in someone else. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you, Vinny. This podcast is called Shifting Dimensions. So I want to wrap it up with a fun question. I know we've talked so much about all of that deep cool. stuff, but love it. has there been anything that you've shifted your perspective on? <laughs> you know, um, I think the biggest shift that I've found is um, many of the people I used to jokingly make fun of, which I'm, I'll call it out. I used to make fun of hippies a lot, you know, growing up. Yeah. And I was an urban kid. I knew how to be a cowboy. I knew how to be an urban kid. I used to do like hip hop and, and, and kind of B-boy type dancing and stuff. But at the same time, I could ride horses. So I, I thought I was well-rounded, but there was this one group and it was the hippies. Like I would, I would jokingly call them like the tree huggers. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, that's probably the most authentic group out there. (laughs) Nobody's trying to be anything that they're not. And so I've really come to love all the different communities that you find on Earth. And that includes the urban group, that includes the metropolitan group, that includes the, you know, the the city folk, the cowboys and cowgirls, the Western folks, Um, but the hippies. I love, I love that culture of inclusion. And I love that they are not trying to be something that they're not. Yeah. And uh, we all could take a lesson from them and kind of apply the, their rules and, 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 and boundaries that they put on themselves. We could apply that to our own lives and just being a lot more inclusive and loving of all kinds of people, no matter what they look like, no matter how they talk, no matter what they dress like, uh, you know, just really loving all forms of life. And, and we don't need to necessarily go out there and do any drugs or anything, but I'm telling you that we can really connect to that love energy and inclusive energy just by opening ourselves up kind of like the hippies did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just shifting, shifting into realizing that, that I was judging this whole community that come to find out it's my community. They're, they're the ones who really embody yeah. love. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you and learn more about your story or work with you one-on-one? Absolutely. So I have a nonprofit. My nonprofit organization is called Living God's Light. So they can go to www.livinggodslight.com. There they can learn more about my story. They can also set up an appointment to um, just have a discussion, or they could set up an appointment to do a, a full life coaching but it's a, a great place to, to learn. And in the coming year, we're actually going to have quite a few more facilitators on that website um, through my organization, my nonprofit. And the nonprofit itself is a spiritual education nonprofit. It's there to help people learn and strengthen uh, their own intuition. That's, that's kind of like my life mission is to help people do that everywhere I go. Yes. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you for stopping by the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. It was great to be here.